Saigo, Bojo, Tansi. It's a pleasure uh, for me to uh, be here this morning. In some ways, I'm very much looking uh, forward to my speaking to you. In other ways, I'm terrified because my job is to ask you to give up some of your most cherished beliefs about treaty and to uh, think about new facts about things that you've never even dreamed about but that you certainly wish would be in place. So it's, uh, it's going to be a, a, a challenge and uh, particularly so because in many respects what has happened until now is a tragedy. And I have it on the screen there, a tragedy in four acts. Uh, what were things before the treaty? What happened at the treaty? After the treaty? But there's always tomorrow. And tomorrow is what I hope we will be uh, focusing on here. Now, when we say the treaty, we usually think about a piece of paper. But the treaty is really, in terms of paper, a total of seven different documents. And you cannot understand fully treaty number five unless you have in your mind all seven of these uh, documents. We're going to go uh, through them. Uh, as I say, it's a bit uh, complicated, but stick with it, and I think you'll be uh, quite happy at the end. I'm going to be here for all three days, and if there's something you want to talk about later on today, tomorrow on Wednesday, I'll be here and I'll be happy to talk to you. Now this uh, presentation about the seven documents are not just seven documents put together, but these documents are linked by what I'm calling a golden thread. It goes from one to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. These are all tied together. They use the same language, they speak about the same thing, and they'll get you there in a very good place if you follow them through to the end. Uh, there's the Royal Proclamation of uh, 1763. Uh, Grand Chief Daniel spoke about uh, Pontiac, and yes, the Royal Proclamation uh, was a result of that. But that was followed by something few people uh, remember, and that is the Treaties of Niagara in 1764. 1763 was what King George III had to say. 1964 was when your ancestor traveled to Niagara and participated in a meeting there of 2,000 chiefs from all over the eastern part of North America. And they agreed upon accepting the offer of peace from uh, King George. Then after that, there is what's called the Northwestern uh, Territories Order of uh, 1870, uh, also the Rupert's Land Order, which is followed by your numbered treaty. Then we have the Natural Resources uh, Transfer Act, the Constitution of Canada in 1982, and today the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which is right now before the Senate for approval, the Senate of Canada for approval as the laws of Canada must be in harmony with the UN Declaration. And that brings us up to today. Now this uh, presentation is also about four different parties. The first parties were your great-great-great-grandparents who entered into Treaty 5. Sovereign people, 
self-governing, self-determining, very proud and very capable uh, people for whom you would not be here were it not for them. And then the others are the crown of Great Britain and Ireland, the settler government of John A. MacDonald and his successors, and about you. Because you are the great-great-great-grandchildren of the people who entered into Treaty 5. But first, we have to unlearn most of what we already know. We have to unlearn uh, so that we uh, can learn. For the uh, last 150 years, the central goal of Canada's Aboriginal policy was to eliminate indigenous government, to act as if indigenous people had no rights, to terminate the treaties, and through a process of assimilation to cause you to cease to exist as distinct legal, social, cultural, religious, and racial entities in Canada. It tried to do all these things. Every single one of them it tried to do. The words I've just spoken are not mine. They're the words of Senator Murray Sinclair from Manitoba. That's what he wrote in the report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. A country that engages in cultural genocide seeks out to destroy the political and social institutions of the targeted group. We're talking about destroying the whole thing of your great-great-great-grandparents. That's what he wrote in the report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. A country that engages in cultural genocide seeks out to destroy the political and social institutions of the targeted group. We're talking about destroying the whole thing of your great-great-great-grandparents. Land is seized. Populations are forcibly transferred. Their movement is restricted. Languages are banned. Spiritual leaders are persecuted. Spiritual practices are forbidden. Objects of spiritual value are confiscated and destroyed. Families are disrupted to prevent the transmission of cultural values, identity, and history from one generation to the next. And Canada did all those things. How could that have happened? Well, it's uh, very simple. From the very beginning, the settlers that took over Canada engaged in an intentional campaign of deception, which has now become embedded as Canada's official history. It is the history that you learned when you went to school. Those of you who are still in school are still learning it. It has been embedded from one generation to the next to the next. And the right questions are no longer being asked. The jurisprudence, what the courts have ruled over the last 150 years, the government policy, for 150 years has created a new law, a new history, which conceals the true facts. The report of the Royal Commission of 1996, made its report in 1996, uh, what, uh, 22 years ago, said this. This is a Royal Commission. Uh, Mr. 
Professor Chartrand over there was one of the commissioners who made this report. Canada has been built on a foundation of false premises and institutionalized amnesia. The memory gone. Amnesia. Worthy newcomers came from Europe and discovered unoccupied land. The inhabitants that they found here were wild, ignorant, savage people with strange and ungodly practices. That over time, the settlers' example that would appreciate the settlers' superior wisdom gradually became civilized. Or, they left, would be left behind in the March of Progress, anthropological footnotes in history. A country cannot be built on a living lie. And that's the problem Canada has today, of trying to reconcile what happened into a good positive relationship and it doesn't fit because what they are asking you to recognize is not true. Uh, we've all been deceived and our task today, your task, my task, all of us, is to find the true facts, make them known, and to change the course of history to one that is honorable and a good foundation a good future for all of us. So I'm asking you now to think about something that is called the doctrine of discovery. Of when you uh, hear all this and you understand what the doctrine of discovery is all about, you're going to laugh. You're going to say, it's foolish, you know, that anyone would believe that. But the law of Canada is based upon the doctrine of discovery, using, as we'll find out, another name. You see, with the discovery of the Americans, Americas, 1492, a new practice was started. Church officials of the time said that God gave the entire earth to Christians and non-Christians, heathens, could not own land. You had to be a Christian to own land. And indigenous people were viewed upon as a part of nature, akin to the animals of the forest. We have herds of elk, we have flocks of geese, we have coveys of pigeons, and we have bands of Indians. That's where the word band comes from. It's a dehumanizing thing. Human beings organize themselves into governments and civilizations, but Indians organize themselves into bands in the same way that elks organize themselves into herds. You were viewed as a part of nature, akin to the animals of the forest. Not quite humans, incapable of holding lands. And so when uh, a man named John Cabot and his three sons arrived in Canada in 1496, he was armed with a piece of paper called Henry VIII's Charter, and it gave him full and pre authority, faculty, and power to sail to all parts, regions, and coasts of the eastern, northern, western, and northern sea under our banners, flags, and ensigns to find, discover, and investigate whatsoever lands, countries, regions, or provinces of heathens and infidels in whatsoever part of the world placed which before this time were unknown to all Christians. We have also given license, acquiring for us the dominion, the title, 
the jurisdiction of the same towns, castles, cities, islands so discovered. In other words, the piece of paper from Henry VIII gave John Cabot the authority to go and claim all of this for Henry VIII, and he would be the ruler of it. And there he is, John Cabot, arriving there, and he's carrying the flag, he's carrying the cross. He's going to plant those, and with the planting of the flag and the cross, zap. You've all been zapped, and you are now a part of the empire of Henry III. All Cabot had to do was to put up this large cross, this uh, flag of St. Mark, the flag of England, and Zat, the indigenous people of the Americas, were no longer sovereign, no longer owned any lands, and the law still says that in 2018. That's the law. So, 1534, Jacques Cartier discovers Canada for France. And then we have the same thing. You see the over on the left-hand side there, those uh, kind of human-like creatures there? You know, they are the infidels that uh, they are talking about. Not really quite human, but they, they've got some hope, some possibility. And there they are. We have Martin Frobisher coming up into your own territory in Treaty 5, arriving in 1577. And what did Martin Frobisher do? He went around throughout Treaty 5 territory as much as he could go, and he heaped up stones in big piles. By doing that, zapped again. As if by magic, the indigenous people had come under British sovereignty, and those piles of stones are evidence of it. And because of that, there are coins, Canadian coins, that are issued in the name of John Frobisher, and he gets a stamp of his own. Samuel Champlain, state claim for France, by setting up crosses, and then after setting up the crosses, he then begged the Indians. He said, uh, hey, I got to go back to France and do some things. Would you look after those crosses while I'm gone? And they did. The Indians apparently were not aware that they and all their future generations had been zapped by that planting of the cross on their lands. They no longer had title or ownership or anything of those lands. Now today, it does not take a law degree for you to see that such claims are extravagant, they're absolutely absurd, as a legal scholar, Brian Slattery, puts it. But nevertheless, they remain the law of Canada today. It is the responsibility of lawyers to put a stop to it. I don't know why they haven't done it long ago, and I don't see anyone doing it right now. But if you haven't noticed already this assertion of sovereignty with the flag and the cross is something that only works when white people apply it to other people for the rights, lands, and resources of people of color. If you try to go over to London right now with your flag and your cross, and you try to plant there and claim London as yours, you'll be laughed at or put in jail. But these guys all got away with it, and that's what we're doing today. Samuel Champlain staked this claim. I've already done that slide. But what the doctrine of discovery requires is an ocean shore to make it work. 
because you have to bring in supplies, you have to bring in settlers, you have to bring arms and armed force in order to defend what you're doing. Because elsewhere, there has to be some other method, like the territory that is yours is not easily accessible. And so how do we do it? We do it with a treaty. Look at the map, of which I'm about to show you, and see this a white area involved in the center of the map. And if you look over on the right-hand side, you will see Canada as it existed in 1867. That little tiny little colored strip over there is Canada, and that's all that was Canada. Upper Canada, Lower Canada, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island. So, if very easy, if you look over to British Columbia on the uh, left-hand side and the uh, far west, you see how easy it was for ships to come in, bringing supplies, bringing settlers, and saying, this land is now ours. But try to do that in Treaty 5 territory. It's not so easy. So they're going to do treaties. Now, what is a treaty? If you look at the dictionary, the definition of a treaty is between two or more states or sovereigns. In other words, if you're, if you're buying a, a used car or something or buying a house, you don't do a treaty, you do a contract. But if you're doing a treaty, it implies that two sovereign parties are doing the treaty. And we define what a treaty is. It's a written agreement between countries in which they agree to do a particular thing or to help each other. So Treaty 5 is by definition a treaty between two countries or two nations, two sovereign peoples. So who called this a treaty? Well, Queen Victoria did. It's Her Majesty Queen Victoria, Queen of Great Britain and Ireland. That's who called it a treaty. So that was recognition that the other party that the Queen enters into a treaty with was a sovereign people. In order to understand the situation, uh, back in 1760, before the Royal Proclamation, uh, Pontiac and the Anishinaabe, the Ojibwe's, the Dakotas, the Mohawks were all determined to do one thing, and that was to drive the British back into the Atlantic Ocean and let them go, because they had had enough. They had burned six of the seven English forts. They were, they were ready to go. The crown responded by saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, please, please. It isn't us, the crown, that's doing this. Those silly settlers are the ones who are doing this. And so I, King George III, am taking back all of my, the relationship with indigenous people and put it back on a sovereign basis again. And we will issue this royal proclamation. So that is document number one that we're going to talk about. And that was accepted by 1764 Treaties of Niagara and reinstatement of the two-row wampum and the covenant chain of friendship. And those treaties of Niagara are documents number two. The two-row wampum is very simple. It's uh, two purple rows on a white background. 
And the story is that the uh, Dutch came to the probably the Iroquois at that time and said, uh, we've got an idea. We're getting along pretty well. We'll be your fathers and you'll be our children and we'll live together as a family. <laughs> and of course, the indigenous people laughed at that idea and they said, no, no, we're going to be brothers and sisters. We'll live together still as a family, but equal side. You take all your people and put them in your ship on one, one row. We'll take all our people and we'll put them in our canoe on our side. Our language, our religion, our way of life, everything. You take all of your stuff, you put them on your ship, and we'll sail down the river together, side by side and in peace. And if ever either of us needs help, we can ask the other one and we'll help each other. That's the two-row wampum. And when uh, we, uh, Grand Chief Daniel mentioned that maybe we're going to have to accept the charter, we're going to have to accept some of these other things, well, that could be. Uh, but on the other hand, just to remind people of the two-row wampum, the charter is in your ship. It's not ours. Your laws are yours. We have our way of doing things. So the Royal Proclamation came out. It's a very official uh, document. And it uh, said uh, certain things which I'll quote. The two-row wampum is on the right-hand side. <clears throat> the Royal Proclamation says, And whereas great frauds and abuses have been committed in purchasing lands of the Indians. To the great prejudice of our interests and to the great dissatisfaction of the said Indians, in order therefore that such irregularities then or in the future and to the end that Indians may be convinced of our justice, and determined resolution to remove all reasonable cause of discontent. In other words, this is an apology. Hey, wait a minute. Don't drive us into the Atlantic Ocean. We're sorry. It isn't my fault. I'm going to prevent this from happening. So the proclamation said, and whereas it is just and reasonable and essential to our interests, and the security of our colonies, and the several tribe, nations or tribes of Indians with whom we are connected. Notice the word nations of Indians. Should not be molested or disturbed in the possession of such parts of our dominion and territories as not having been ceded to or purchased by us are reserved to them. Now this does not mean Indian reserves, like you know you all have reserves. But this isn't what they're talking about. They're saying that all lands on which we have not been permitted to settle, all those lands are lands reserved to the Indians. Remember that term, lands reserved to the Indians. And the Royal Proclamation then goes on to say that no private person can purchase land from the Indians. Because that was what the trouble was. Someone would pay someone some money and they'd say that land is ours and then there'd be problems. And so to allow proper settlement that if at any time the Indians should be inclined to dispose of said lands. Inclined to dispose. The same shall be purchased only for us in our name, name of the crown, at some public meeting or assembly of the said Indians. In other words, the Royal Proclamation sets out the rules that the British Empire must follow in order to enter into a treaty. Lands must be, uh, you want to discuss a treaty, 
you must obtain free, prior, and informed consent of the Indians to be able to have that land. And lands must be compensated for. This is a part of the Constitution of Canada. The Royal Proclamation is a document that Canada must obey. So, in 1864, when the settlers decided, you know, we've got this PEI and we've got Nova Scotia and New Brunswick and all that, we ought to confederate and become some kind of a super colony. And what they were really after was the riches of what they called Rupert Land and what you all called, your ancestors, called our land. So the leaders of the colonies went over to England and they met with Queen Victoria. And they said, uh, we've got this idea of creating this uh, super colony over there in North America. And uh, we would like to get those lands that were just on white on that map, all of that land. We'd like that to become a part of Canada. Queen Victoria replied, uh, sorry, these lands might be British North America, but the Indians have the title to the land. And we do not have any treaty with the tribes and nations who inhabit it. If you want those lands to be a part of Canada, you must obtain their consent. Their consent. So that is why the crown, with all of its great glory and sovereignty and power and armies and navies, recognized indigenous sovereignty, your sovereignty. The crown knew that it did not have the sovereignty that's called dominion, where you can tell someone else what to do. And it knew that the territory involved was not a part of Canada until treaty. So here again we have this uh, 1867 map, all this white area here. And if you want to see the boundaries of exactly what is Rupert's land and what is the Northwestern Territory, uh, there you have it. That whole huge chunk in the center in 1867 was not a part of Canada. And the area that is Treaty 5 today was not a part of Canada until Treaty 5 was entered into. It was Treaty 5 that made it a part of Canada by the agreement of your ancestors. We don't mind having this through a treaty arrangement. And so this is the way that the whole history unfolded. A long series of necessary legal processes for this land to become a part of Canada. And Queen Victoria knew what George III had, had decided in the Royal Proclamation. That was her grandfather. George III, his grandfather of Queen Victoria. The, they knew it as a family thing. So before then, Canada was just another colony, actually until 1982. 1982. That's when Canada became a country with a constitution and was no longer a colony of Great Britain. Before that time, there were no Canadian citizens. There were no Canadian passports. There were British subjects, and if you wanted a passport to travel, you had to get a British passport. Canada did not have ambassadors 
with other countries because Canada was not a country that could be accepted as having an ambassador. This happened when Canada, 1982, became a country. Now, where we are sitting right now was not a part of Canada until Treaty 1 was entered into. It was Treaty 1 that made this a part of Canada because the people of Treaty 1 gave their free, prior, and informed consent through the treaty to become a part of Canada under the conditions that were in the treaty. And until compensation is paid, it may not yet be a part of Canada. I'll come to that and show you how that is in the law of Canada, that until compensation has been paid for the lands of Treaty 5 to you all, it may not yet be a part of Canada. Now, the treaty, you often think of our treaty with Canada. But your treaty is not with Canada. The word Canada does not appear in your treaty. What appears is the uh, crown of Great Britain, Her Majesty, the Queen of Great Britain and Ireland. That's your treaty partner. So, as a result of this discussions with the Fathers of Confederation, uh, Queen Victoria issued certain orders, orders, that Rupert's Land and Northwestern Territory, these orders were dated the 23rd of June, 1870, had the effect of recognizing your title to your lands. And at that particular meeting where the order uh, was uh, issued, I don't know why, but this impresses me, that the Queen, Most Excellent Majesty, was present, physically present at the meeting where this was decided, along with the Lord President of the Privy Council, the seal of the Lord Privy Council, the Lord Chamberlain, the whole majesty and royalty of that governed Great Britain was present at the signing of this document, this order of Queen Victoria. And what does it say? The orders say, and furthermore, that upon the transference of the territories in question to the Canadian government, the claims of the Indian tribes to compensation for lands required for purposes of settlement will be considered and settled in conformity with the equitable principles which have uniformly governed uh, the British Crown in dealing with the Aborigines. Okay, this has some important words in it. Uh, first of all, the purpose of the treaties is settlement, period. Doesn't talk about re uh, resources. Doesn't talk about anything else. Only settlement. Second of all, there has to be this consent given. And third of all, there has to be certain principles, very high principles, that are governed by the British Crown. In other words, the whole reputation of the British Crown it depends upon observance of these uh, principles. And so when we go to the treaty, uh, what do we find in it? That the treaty is regard to settlement and immigration, a tract of country bounded and described as here and after here and after mentioned, and to obtain the consent thereto. So you may have noticed there's some discussion today about, you know, there's an article in the paper by a Premier of Pallister just this last week saying, hey, uh, our access to resources is, is now being uh, challenged 
Uh, we're going to have to go through certain environmental assessments and things like that. Uh, these are our lands. And this thing about consent is going to just hold us back. But that's the law of Canada today, that they must have free, prior, and conformed consent of yourselves to do anything with your land. So, one of the lessons that was forgotten and one of the mistakes that Queen Victoria made. Remember King George, the Royal Proclamation? Because of all those frauds and abuses, all those things that were happening? Well, Queen Victoria made the same mistake of letting Sir John A. Macdonald do the treaty making. That was what King George had prevented by saying, no, we're taking it all back. We, the royal crown, will deal with the treaty making. We're not going to let the settlers do it anymore. But George, John A. MacDonald did the thing, and the rest is history. So <clears throat> the document number four is the treaty, treaty number five. But I want to make an important point with regard to treaty number one. Treaty number one, which is, as we know where it is in southern Manitoba, was not supposed to be treaty number one. It was supposed to be treaty number two. What happened was that the treaty commissioners set out and came across from Sault Ste. Marie, and when they reached Rainy River, they decided that was the place that they were to have the first treaty. And the people gathered there and they talked for a week about this treaty thing. And at the end of the discussion, the people who were expected to sign treaty number one said, hmm, I don't think so. Uh, we need more time to think it over. Uh, we're going to take the next few winters and think about it. Uh, come back and see us sometime in the future. And the commissioners had nothing that they could do except pack up their bags and head for Winnipeg. Because free, prior, and con informed consent had been denied. So this is uh, what happened. It's consent in action. <clears throat> so let's go back to treaty number five. Uh, it's known as the uh, Winnipeg Treaty. It got started in 1875 at Barons River and Norway House by the Queen of Great Britain and England and Ireland and the Ojibwe and Swampy Cree people of Lake Winnipeg. That's what history says. Additional adhesions to the treaty were entered into in 1876. Through the treaty, the Queen received the right to take up certain lands for immigration and settlement. That's what the treaty says, for immigration and settlement with the condition that the Canadian government would pay compensation for their use. The treaty with the adhesions covers much of central and northern Manitoba, some parts going into Saskatchewan and Ontario. Now, let's go back to that time in 1875. Uh, things were pretty tough. The fur industry had kind of collapsed. There weren't as many animals as there were before, and the people in Europe weren't buying as many furs as they had before. Prices dropped. There was no alternative, like in the South, people could take up agriculture. There was starvation, starvation specifically around Norway House. 
smallpox was moving in and ravishing entire villages. Can you imagine 90% of a village being destroyed by smallpox? Can you imagine this room where 10% of you are left to bury the dead? These were exceedingly tough times and Europeans began to move in at this very same time. Now, one of the reasons that Treaty 5 became important was not because of settlement. They didn't think, even back then, that there'd be whole huge flocks of settlers rushing into Treaty 5 territory. And that proved to be a fairly accurate uh, estimate at the time. But they were interested in resources. Maybe not the lithium that Ch uh, Grand Chief Daniels uh, mentioned, <clears throat> but they knew of other resources that were there and they wanted them. They also wanted to be able to have transportation into the West. How are they going to get to British Columbia? Well, there was going to be the railroad and all that, but they also thought that the waterway through the Saskatchewan River and so on would be their key of getting into the West. And so this is why the Canadian government saw Treaty 5 as uh, being open to the communities around the lake and at Norway House. As had been the case in Treaty 1, Treaty 2, Treaty 3, Treaty 4, the government of Canada had no intention whatsoever of following the orders of the Queen. They were settlers. This was going to be their country. God gave it to them and they were going to run it as they wished. And they simply ignored the queen. So this is the way it was when these two men pictured here, one named James McKay, <clears throat> who proudly called himself a Scotch half-breed because saying he was a Scotch half-breed had two hidden messages. Number one is, I'm not an Indian. And second of all, I'm not a damn Catholic, because Catholics were discriminated against in those days almost as much as Indians. So saying a Scotch half-breed was a sign of great proud, pride. So they got on to a boat. The other guy is uh, Alexander Morris. Most of his photographs do not have the mustache but he grew one while he was a lieutenant governor of uh, Manitoba. And they sailed on a ship called the Colville. Uh, this is the boat that they traveled on. It burned wood, and the wood, the steam, and the boilers turned the paddle wheel at the back. It doesn't look like a modern cruise ship by a long way. Can you imagine that if these two men, and uh, Morris also brought along his daughter, uh, Christina and Elizabeth, on the trip, but they were going to take this great journey, that they believed in the magic of what they were doing. It's the flag and the cross again. That they were very seriously taking this trip in September, going on, you know, who knows, and we'll see the difficulties they had. But they were willing to do it because if they did and they could get the Indians to accept the treaty, that whole territory was going to become theirs. So they uh, get going and they uh, set out to uh, Barron's River. They can't leave. They're stuck because of a storm. And for two days, they have to sit there uh, just outside of, at the very beginning of Lake uh, Winnipeg, to the south, 
wait there for a storm, and then sail north. When they get there, the treaty meeting was to take place in the Wesleyan Mission Schoolhouse near the Barrens River Hudson Bay Post. They arrived there after the lengthy journey in that paddle wheel steamer. They couldn't start their meeting until 4 o'clock at night. They adjourned at 11 o'clock. The treaty transaction took seven hours. And in that seven hours, the treaty was agreed to. The chief and headmen had signed the treaty. It took until 11, 1 a.m. for everyone to receive their $5 and make their X that they had received it, all recorded on a pay list. If you read the treaty, this $5 is not for payment of your lands. The five bucks was a gift from the bountiful benevolence of Her Majesty the Queen. It was a gift for showing up at the treaty meeting. It was a party favor. So all of this was done in one afternoon and evening. You've got to believe that Alexander Morris and James McKay believed that through this treaty, they had just gotten all those lands. Why else would they go there? That means that they had to believe that your ancestors owned those lands. Why would you go to all that trouble to do a treaty if someone didn't own the land? In other words, the very treaty itself is an admission that you did own the lands. The other belief that the commissioners had was that if we do our magic, if we can do our planting of the flag and the cross, that the land will become ours. And so if you read what the commissioners believed, the people had just ceded, released, surrendered, and yield up forever all their lands, lakes, rivers, streams, their entire livelihood, their children's entire heritage. You've got to believe that if you believe what the commissioners were believing. Can you imagine, you know, at the getting towards the end of the meeting, and Alexander Morris says in English, translated by James McKay, uh, Chief, uh, you know all this land on the map here? You know, all this of where you fish and where you hunt and, you know, all that land? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, Chief, uh, would you give me all that land? I want all of that. Would you give that to me? And the Chief says, all of it? Yeah, all of it. Give me all of it. Okay, you can have it. That's what you're asked to believe. That's what you're asked to believe. So, that task was finish finished at Barron's River. The commissioners set out the following morning for Norway House, 189 kilometers away, along the east coast of the lake via the Nelson River. There were strong winds. They had to remain at anchor all day. They couldn't leave because of the storm. They finally set sail at midnight, and at nine the next morning, they passed the old abandoned Norway House post, went on to the new post at three in the afternoon. They met in a large warehouse with two groups of Cree. One group had been converted to Christianity. The second group was known as the Wood Band. It had not converted, excepting for their chief, Donald William Sinclair, who had recently been baptized. Those were the two groups who were present there. 
<coughs> the commissioner's strategy was uh, to talk first about the terms of the treaty. And everything was translated by James McKay. Who knows what James McKay said? Nobody. Nobody. What was promised? Nobody. But after they talked about it, they talked about reserves. The Christian group wanted to go into farming. And they were told that they would get a reserve in Fisher River, uh, which happens to be in Treaty 2 territory, uh, which had already been promised in Treaty 2. But that was no problem. We'll give that to the uh, Fisher River, what became the Fisher River people. So they talked a little bit more. The treaty was signed. The medals and uniforms were presented. The chiefs thanked Her Majesty for their kindness to the Indian people, according to the diary. The whole affair ended the same day. And you are asked to believe that the people gave away all their land, all their waters, all their lakes, all their rivers. And then we see this green area here, which suddenly appears because as a result of that, Treaty 5 was now a part of Canada. So what do the commissioners do next? They go over to Grand Rapids. And Grand Rapids is another 130 kilometers southwest from where they were. The meeting took place on a cold September day. There had been a large fire built. The commissioners used the same strategy. But there was a problem with the reserve's location, which was on the north shore of the area there, which meant that had their reserve remained there, they would have had control of the passage in Saskatchewan River. So the commissioners wanted the people to move their reserve, move their community, their homes, their you know, everything, on to, over to the other shore. The community said, well, okay, but you got to pay us $500. Can you imagine to move, rebuild their homes on the other side, rebuild their communities? The commissioners agreed they would pay the 500 bucks the following year. When they came back a year later, the chief at Grand Rapids was surprised. He thought the negotiations were still going. He thought all he did was sign a receipt for his five bucks. He was waiting to negotiate the treaty. But the treaty had already been negotiated. So that was the, what had happened. And on their way back, uh, uh, going back to Red River, they encountered a man uh, named Thick Hook, Thick Foot in English. He said he was the spokesperson for the Jackhead uh, Point people. And uh, they told the commissioners they'd heard about the treaty. They wanted to be included because what happens at a treaty? Everyone gets $5. That's what happens at a treaty. You get $5, and the chiefs and headmen get a suit of clothes. So Thickfoot said, OK, I'll sign, but I'm going to be the chief. And all the people that were there said, no, no, he's not going to be our chief. He's not our chief. And the commissioner said, but he'll sign. And he signed. So that was uh, what happened. Eight days, four treaty meetings, 4,000 kilometers of travel, and it was a done deal. The commissioners, however, were not done with the treaty because when they got back home, they changed the wording of the treaty 
to extend the treaty territory even further than had been negotiated. And they wanted it to go to include the power. So they just extended it. You know, take a little white out and put it on, sign over again, and it was done. As a result, the commissioners in their diaries wrote, everything went very well on this trip. We have added to Canada's territory 258,000 square kilometers of lands, waters, and resources for free. That's what you're asked to believe. There's a description of where the lines were going to be drawn. And they would go around later and do adhesions of anyone who had not been present. There are many historians today who say that the commissioners were so eager to uh, get an agreement to the treaty, they never discussed what the treaty meant. It was not a part of the discussions. And in addition, can you imagine explaining the complexity of a treaty after you've just had this steamer ride in there? You've got a few hours to do it. But the commissioner saw no need to explain the treaty because it already had been decided and the treaty was not explained. So, it's important to understand because Queen Victoria had said, you do these treaties the same way that we've always done our treaties. That in 1870, before the treaty, in eastern Canada, certain lands were decided by treaty to be set aside for immigration and settlement. An Indian agent was hired by the Indians to sell the land. The money from the sale of the lands went into something called a revenue account. And the interest from the revenue account was drawn out by the government of the First Nation that entered into the treaty. In other words, the, the nation entering into the treaty did what's called a seller-take-back mortgage. All right, you want to buy the land? Okay, we'll sell you the land. Oh, you don't have any money. Well, we'll loan you the money so you can pay us. And then you pay us back the loan. Okay? Agreed. And that's the way it was done in eastern Canada in 1870. And as a result of that, there was no tax money that went to Indians because Indians had their own money, their own money from compensation for the use of lands. The rest of the land that was theirs they continued to occupy. That was lands reserved for the Indians. At that time, Indian Affairs in all of Eastern Canada had 14 employees. They could govern all of Indian Affairs with 14 employees because Indians governed their own affairs. They had their own money. They spent their own money. No taxpayer money went to Indians. So, what happened to compensation out here in uh, Western Canada, in Treaty 5 territory? Well, John A. MacDonald, as I mentioned, hated Catholics. And he needed to get in as many Protestants into Manitoba as quickly as possible before they established a legislature. 
because if they had established a legislature, the majority of the members of the provincial legislature would have been Catholics. John A. MacDonald says, ah, uh -uh, no way. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to declare a legislature for the next three or four years until I can get settlers in. Settlers, free land, all the land you want. Just move out there. You'll get a farm. You'll get a homestead. And that's what he did. Canada, Manitoba, free farms for the million. 40,000 men needed in Western Canada to farm it. 160 acres for free. And by the way, uh, John A. MacDonald said, we're not going to allow any Africans, Jews, or Asians, or East Indians, or Southern Europeans into Western Canada. And so that's how the population of the immigrants that came here were all white Europeans. And by the way, Frenchmen weren't allowed in either. So, uh, 1873, there was a lot of discontent amongst the people who signed Treaty 1, Treaty 2, and Treaty 3 was being signed. There was no plow, there was no reserves, settlers were coming in on all sides, Complaints reached the House of Commons, and Sir John A. MacDonald told the House of Commons that, well, I'm not going to reopen the treaty. And this is what the Hansard of the House of Commons says. The only way to deal with Indians is to be firm and just. The Indians had been free to enter into the treaty or to reject it. The Indians knew what they were surrendering, and therefore, it was a fair, just, honest treaty, and it must be maintained. Okay, so what, what have we learned here? Well, first of all, that in 1871, the Canadian government had no plan whatsoever to deal with the Indians to fulfill the orders of Queen Victoria. And as another historian puts it, the negotiations were badly handled by an ill-prepared government. So that brings us to uh, 1930 and the NRTA. Now, in some ways, I understand why people here are upset about the NRTA. Because at that time, the Dominion government, federal government, transferred all of the crown lands over to the provinces. Now, the reason I say I don't quite understand the problem is that the crown had already stolen the land from the Indians. It'd be like, you know, someone has stolen your car and you're complaining about it, complaining about it, complaining about it. And then one day you see that the guy who stole your car has given your car to his son. And you're all upset. He can't give my car away to his son. But he's already stolen it. You see, the land that was transferred in 1830 was already stolen from, quote, the Indians. But there's a thing in the NRTA that is interesting. <coughs> In the NRTA, it says that the transfer of lands to the province is subject to any trust existing in respect thereof and to any interest other than that of the crown in the same. Who do you think they're talking about? The Indians who still have the interest in the land, you see. And there is a trust responsibility of the crown to pay for it. That is in there. But no one has ever acted on this. No First Nation, no one has ever uh, taken this to court. <coughs> so, 
we see that in the British North America Act, the eastern provinces, Ontario, Quebec, so on, all lands, mines, minerals, and royalties belonging to the several provinces subject to any trust existing in respect thereof and to any interest other than that of the province in the same. There is one of the legal cases. But after 1930, the next document is the Constitution of Canada of 1982. And the question <clears throat> that I'm raising here, is the government's action constitutional? Is the government of Canada today behaving according to the Constitution? Did you know that the Rupert's Land Order and the Northwestern Territory Order is part of the Constitution of Canada? And that in all of the years from 1982 up till now, there has not been one court case that depends upon this, not one. <clears throat> Section 52, you all know maybe about Section 35 of the Constitution because it protects your inherent treaty and other rights. But Section 52 of the Constitution says, the Constitution of Canada is the supreme law of Canada. And any law that is inconsistent with the provisions of the Constitution is to the extent of the inconsistency of no force or effect. Okay? Any law of Canada is that contradicts the Constitution has no force and effect. But Section 2, subsection 2 of Section 52 says, the Constitution of Canada includes the Canada Act of 1982, B, the acts and orders referred to in the schedule. You know, I probably read that a hundred times in many years afterwards, and it never occurred to me, schedule? What schedule? The schedule in the Constitution. No one here knows about it, but let's look at the schedule. What's in the schedule? A list of the documents. And one of the documents is the order of Her Majesty in Council admitting Rupert's Land and the Northwest Territories into the Union, dated the 23rd day of June, 1870. In other words, that order that says that land must be compensated for before it becomes a part of Canada is in the Constitution. And any law that contradicts that is of no force and effect. So that's the golden thread. And that's why, as Sal Sanderson would say, treaties trump laws. Your treaty has more power than the laws of Canada. Rupert's land shall be admitted into and become a part of the dominion of Canada upon the terms and conditions set forth. Now I know that's legalistic language, but let's put it in the negative. upon the transference of the land. I mandate that treaties will be negotiated in my name and under my supervision for the sole purpose of immigration and settlement with no mention of resources Compensation must be paid, and the treaties will be just and equitable. Uh, we now have 
uh, two legal, written legal opinions that say, yeah, that's the way it is. One of these uh, legal opinions, interestingly enough, was asked for in 1982 by uh, Treaty Number 8. They hired a lawyer then named uh, Kent McNeil, who is just now retiring, and he wrote the legal opinion. It's been around all these times. And I got another legal opinion in 2012 saying the same thing. Now, what is settlement? Settlement means to take up one's residence in a place to inhabit. To settlement does not mean engage in forestry. Settlement does not mean put in a mine, put in an oil well to take up lands and do nothing with them. The crown has a choice with all your land in Treaty 5. They either take it up and pay for it, or it is still your land and under your jurisdiction. I mentioned this is what Kent McNeil says in his legal opinion, no claims to compensation for lands not required for settlement were envisioned because it must have been assumed that those lands would be left in the possession of the Indian tribes. It might even be contended that the condition limited the Canadian government's authority to negotiate surrenders of land actually required for settlement. This was so clear that in Treaties 1 and Treaty 2, it doesn't even mention hunting, fishing, or trapping. It doesn't even mention it. Treaty 3 slips it in, and Treaty 5 slips in something more, but it's not according to the orders of Queen Victoria. The validity of surrenders for other purposes may be open to question. Now, equitable principles. The treaty has to be equitable principles. What does that mean? It has to be fair, has to be just, has, it be re has to be reasonable. That's the constitutional standard that the government of Canada must be held. This is an imperative order of the Crown. Treaties must be obeyed. And the validity of the government's conduct is open to challenge. The summary, only for settlement, fair compensation must be paid, all other lands still, quote, belong to the Indians, and resources were not included in the treaty. So, compensation, this is the old document, right at the time, saying compensation has to be paid by the government of Canada. And furthermore, upon the transference of the territories in question to the Canadian government, the claims of the Indian tribes to compensation for lands required for purpose of settlement will be considered and settled in conformity with the equitable practices. In other words, this is repeated in these documents time after time after time. So, here it is, right out of Hansard. It's repeated there. We go to the treaty. In order that there be peace and goodwill with the Indians, that they may know and assume of what allowance they are to be paid, this $5 for the benevolence of Her Majesty's uh, bounty and benevolence. 
My time is starting to run out. I want to summarize. The day before the treaty, your people, at the, at the time of the treaty, remember that steamboat goes in there. And what do they find? There are two men who are commissioners acting for the crown. What do the indigenous nation have? They have self-government. <clears throat> they have self-determination. They have lands. They have waters. They have resources. What does the crown have the day before the treaty? Zilch. Nada. Nothing. Zero. What happens on the day of the treaty? What do the indigenous nations give up? Well, nothing, really. Did they give up self-government? No. Did they say, no, we're no longer going to determine our own affairs? No. Did they say we're going to give up all those hundreds of thousands of square kilometers of lands and waters? No. So, that means that it was the crown that was requesting consent to apply its sovereignty to the lands on which there would be settlement and to acquire these lands in exchange for compensation. So what, where are we now, the day after the treaty? Well, you still have your sovereignty. You still have your lands, excepting for those few lands that are taken up for settlement. You still have your resources. You have compensation for the lands <clears throat> that were taken up. What does the crown have? Lands for settlement. Sovereignty over settlers' land. Now comes the last document, the United Nations Declaration. Canadian law has to be in harmony with the UN Declaration. It, it talks about everything I've just talked about, historic injustices, colonization, dispossession of lands and territories. It's concerned, it recognizes the need to promote the rights of indigenous peoples. It recognizes the need to uh, promote the rights affirmed in treaties. It is concerned that control by indigenous people over developments that they need to maintain and strengthen their institutions. But Article 8 says that they have the right not only to avoid forced assimilation, think residential school, <clears throat> but they also, part B too, any action which has the aim or effect of dispossessing them of their lands, territories, or resources. <clears throat> Article number 10, Indian people shall not be forcefully removed from their lands or territories. And Indian people who are removed are assured of just, fair compensation. So remember that golden thread. Royal Proclamation, Treaty of Niagara, the Rupert's Land Order, Treaty Number 5, Natural Resources Transfer Act, Constitution of Canada, the UN Declaration, they are all tied together. I'm going to just make this very brief. There was a statement written by another commissioner here in Manitoba, Provence, and you can read it for yourself, that Indians may be expected to claim the exclusive right of property to lands, and they deny to the government the right to possess without their consent. And as a natural conclusion, reserve to themselves the right of stating their terms and of selecting their reserves. 
Should the Indians ever come to the knowledge that such a system to be followed regarding them, they would fall into a state of discouragement. Provence, 1875. So, that's all I have to say. Except I want to ask the question, uh, what are you going to do about it? So, you've heard about it. Now what are you going to do about it? One of the best investments that can happen is know that true story and then act upon it. Here's the golden thread. Documents are listed in the first column. Was consent required? Yes, 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 yes. Compensation was to be paid? Yes, 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 yes. Only lands for settlement? Yes, yes, yes. The golden thread runs through these. Resources? No, 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 no protected. So there you have it. If you want further information, there's my email address. You can also look at academia.edu website. You'll find a thousand page history of Manitoba. And that's it. Let's go for it. <laughs>